all things Division Three soccer and given me a, a chance to sort of learn about um, your program and, uh, you know, and your views on soccer. Uh, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it and uh, excited to be on and uh, speak with you. And uh, it's just saying before, I appreciate what you're doing for and promotion of the D3 game, I think is, is an important thing. Um, to our student athletes and our programs and uh yeah always excited to have a soccer talk and talk uh college soccer and specifically d3 soccer thanks i i appreciate it it's been it's been quite the the journey so far for me i i um i i mentioned this earlier in the emails like i have a an affinity for your um part of the world i I spent, in 1993, I made my first journey to Salem, Virginia, which I don't know if it's a sister city or right next door, uh, for Mount Union's, University of Mount Union's first football oh. national championship. So, uh, and I know, I think it's like a subsidiary campus to Mount Union yep. in Ohio yeah. since we've been there so often. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I think I carried the cables uh, on the sideline for ESPN one year at the Stag Ball on Mountain Union sideline as a, as a, uh, a side job when I was a student at Roanoke College. So, yeah, you guys have been down here and Salem's hosted, you know, we talk about it. We're hosting the, the soccer national yep. championships. So we, we've hosted, uh, and they've done a fantastic job hosting, you know, everything over the years, yeah. and, and especially in Division Three sports between yeah. football, basketball, lacrosse, um, you know, we've done it all, softball. So, uh, yeah, Mountain Union had a, has had a great run down here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. um, and we'll talk about the what you hosting the national championship and what that means. I think it's, for me, it's like, well, if it's a Division Three national championship, it should be held at a Division Three school and facility. But um, anyhow, so I'm, I'm really excited for that. But, um, hey, maybe we could just start out. Um, maybe you could just go into your coaching journey how you ended up at Roanoke and, you know, any coaches along the way that might might have had a, an impact as to who you are today as a coach. Yeah, I think it's funny because, I, you know, I think any of us who have been in it for any amount of time could go forever on our stories of how, how they got there and just like, you know, the stories within the stories. But um, yeah, trying to keep it a little bit brief, I guess I would start with I was fortunate to grow up in um, – I grew up in Columbia, Maryland, and I was fortunate to grow up there in a time of, uh, I mean, soccer was huge there. And um, just for me personally, just my kind of interest in the game started in that uh, my father had played. And, you know, I think today's, you know, people my age, you know, their kids are all going to have parents that have played a lot of soccer. But prior, it wasn't, you know, so big that maybe your parents had played um, when I was growing up. And so my father had played at the University of Maryland. My uncle had played at the University of Maryland. And then when we grew up in Columbia, it was just a, I mean, a great time for soccer, I think. We, you know, at one point, that Sports Illustrated called it uh, Soccer Town USA alongside Kearney, New Jersey, I believe, with just the amount of the national team players that were being produced out of there. And so um, that kind of sparked my interest in the game and playing. And I was really fortunate to be around as a youth player, a lot of really good coaches and, you know, going to watch my father play in men's league still at that's that same point. And uh, so, yeah, then, you know, kind of taking that interest and that, that love for the game into, you know, ambitions to play in college. Um, I think my search was not unlike, you know, I talk a lot of our recruits here at Roanoke about their search. My search wasn't too unlike a lot of the guys that we have on the team or have had in the program in that, you know, my ambitions were very division one, um, driven when I was in high school and going through the recruiting process at that time and, you know, made a ton of visits to different division one schools and trying to judge interest and all of this. And, uh, you know, kind of on a, I don't know what you want to call it, but, um, it was, I was committed later in the recruiting process as a high school player. And, you know, in, I think February, maybe my senior year and that just didn't find the right fit until I had come down to Roanoke and uh, visited with the coaching staff and on campus. And it was sort of one where I had put, put that visit off for a long time. Hey, you know, sorry, coach, I'm looking at division one schools, yeah. but you know, as it, as it worked out, um, it was a great decision for me and I had a great experience playing at Rona college and, uh, for what, for one of my mentors, which I'll talk about in a second. And, uh, throughout my college experience, um, he got into working camps in the summer, both here at Rona college. And then also would travel, you know, work either back in Maryland where I grew up or, 
uh, at other colleges and started to get that little bit of itch for enjoying the coaching side of things. Um, and then when I graduated, I, uh, you know, I'm a little bit unsure, like I think anybody, what, what exactly you want to do. I really love the coaching aspect, the leadership aspect of, um, you know, the thoughts on that. I thought maybe, you know, anyway, had some different ideas as a business major, what I was going to do, but I was fortunate to grab that graduate assistant job at Goucher College in Baltimore on the women's side. And um, so then the next five years of my coaching journey just get a little wild in that I, 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 I bounced around in, in no bad way, but um, got a lot of experiences in a lot of different places um, for a couple of years there. I had worked at Goucher for two years and then ended up doing an internship at Johns Hopkins through the master's program, which was sort of outside of coaching, but in athletic administration and learned a lot from that. And then um, fortunate to get my first sort of men's assistant coaching role in the division one game at Elon University. So I had moved down to North Carolina, spent a season there. Um, you know, subsequently it gets even more interesting in that the coaching staff was uh, relieved of their duties after that season. And I moved back to Baltimore and worked back at Goucher for a semester before going to High Point University and uh, worked there for a season. And then, um, yeah, so uh, from there, went to Wake Forest uh, University and was an assistant coach there and then went out to University of Denver where I spent I think six or seven years prior to coming back to Roanoke College. So my, you know, my timeline is sort of all over the map, but, um, you know, created a lot of good experiences and got to work with a lot of, you know, like really fortunate, a lot of good coaches and good people over my time and learned a lot about kind of what I was interested in. I guess if I was to note, uh, yeah, again, I, I don't want to leave anyone out here because I worked for some great people and great coaches and learned so much. <laughs> but, you know, my college coach, Scott Allison, who is my boss right now, is our athletic director at Roanoke College. He retired after winning 300 games down here and um, retired as coach and became full-time athletic director. Obviously a big influence on me, and I'm fortunate to have his office across the hall from mine right now. Um, my assistant coach in college was Dustin Fonder. He's the head coach at Campbell University right now, and they are – just killing it in uh, Division One. You know, they've been to the NCAA tournament a handful of times, and so he had a tremendous impact on on you know maybe me as a player, and then also as like my desire to coach. He helped me get that first job at Elon. Um, the two coaches I worked for most recently before coming to Roanoke, Bobby Muse, who's the head coach at Wake Forest right now, but uh, he worked he and I worked together at Wake Forest, and then worked for him at University of Denver for you know, the seven years that I was there and, you know, just learned a tremendous amount from Bobby. And then um, Jay Vidovich, who was the head coach at Wake Forest, um, when I worked there, um, yeah, that was like a, a licensed coaching course every <laughs> single day, working alongside him. So just, you know, in the, in this maybe sort of short time that I worked there, I felt like I learned a lot, but it's not, I mean, I, I worked for a lot of good ones. So yeah, yeah. that's kind of my path. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You weren't too stationary for too long, right? Like at yeah. least leading up to, to Roanoke. Um, hey, let, this just popped into my head. Like, is there, I mean, you have a lot of really, I mean, let's be real, some really great Division One experience. I mean, University of Denver, Wake Forest, you can't go wrong in either one of those places. Is there knowing that it's a different division, but is, did you sort of, do you sort of manage your, your program now like a division one program? Does that make sense? Like whatever you learned as sort of managing a division one program, do you apply it to your, to, to Roanoke? I would say yes. Like obviously every year that I've been here, I have had to learn like what's effective pieces of that management, like what, 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 what is a good puzzle fit, you know, mm -hmm. in the differences of the division. But like, I certainly learned a lot at those programs about, you know, a lot of different aspects of the program that I brought to Roanoke. And I think, you know, in terms of trying to create sort of this, I'll call it a professional environment, but I'm only calling it that from sort of the organization of the whole thing. Maybe not necessarily that we're, like developing professionals necessarily right, right. as a main goal. But um, yeah, so there has been, you know, I think a lot of things that translated. There's also some other things that don't translate exactly right, um, exactly even, I would say, too. And so those are some things that maybe, you know, I've had to learn as I've been here and sort of 
I call it back in division three, but I'm, I'm very happy to be here, but like yeah. in division three, you know, from a player and coaching early on versus coming back. So, um, yeah, there, there are certainly some aspects and mm. that we've been able to bring in and implement, I think have been valuable. And then there are some others that you go like, it's not exactly applicable. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I always wondered, right? Because I, I, from a soccer perspective, again, I, there's, I think just there's differences of speed for the most part and maybe a little bit on the technical side, a little bit more polished. But I always wonder just as far as managing a program as you manage it in Division One, would that is that a like you said, apples to apples comparison to managing division three. And um I'm gonna have to start exploring that more now. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's definitely like um you know, at Denver we're you know, we're we're sort of Building on a program this is a very solid program when kind of Coach Muse got the job out there and I went out there with them, but certainly, you know, goals to be set. But those goals include on field success and all that, but they might also include um, uh, uh, face within the community, you know, the branding of the program, the, the, yeah. the attendance figures the yeah. built a stadium while we were there you know things like that so i think some of that um again some of those things in the administrative side of things fundraising and yeah. alumni networking and, and those things some of them are required at the division one level you know you're you're you're, you're responsible for those things and yeah. maybe here you know again we're going to translate some i think that have worked really well like fundraising yeah. alumni networking maybe some others that are like I, if I put that on the top part of my priority list on the day to day, it's not the thing that's going to be most successful for my student athletes. You know, like like we worry about attendance here and we've done yeah. pretty well with drawing crowds at Roanoke College, I think yeah. part, partially because of the stadium we have and yeah. being able to play at night. But um, it can't also be my number one priority, yeah. every day, yeah. obviously, <laughs> which as a assistant at a wake forest that might have been one of my main roles was to make sure yeah. the spry stadium was filled you know alongside yeah. the marketing team something like yeah, that. yeah 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 okay hey um i've been asking this more of coaches now especially as we're i don't want to say returning to normal because i'm not even sure what normal is anymore but um you know i, I never thought about it because in my world i've been living in this world for five years right like i work from home and i do you know i've never sort of had an issue and when COVID hit it was just sort of okay well the kids are home not not that big of a deal um for me but what you know ha could you just talk about the your COVID year and how difficult that may have been for you as a staff as a yeah as you're trying to manage this con continuous program and and yeah. how difficult that might have been for your players yeah, I mean, I think everyone could say it. It was difficult and they're and they're truthful in saying that. And like I don't ever minimize like our experience compared to anyone else's, especially in the big picture of the pandemic. But it was hard. I mean, it, it was challenging and like it, it definitely tested us and tested, you know, the players and the program in a lot of ways. I I think first and foremost, specifically for us here, we came off of a really good year in 2019, which I thought was a culmination of a, of a lot of factors. You know, we, we made an, uh, an at-large appearance in the NCAA tournament, which was a big step at, at, for us at that time in that, you know, we had worked really hard to, you know, set the goal of being playing in the Nashville field. And um, even the process to which we could uh, strength of schedule ourselves enough, play ranked opponents enough to get that at large bid was a process mm -hmm. that I'm happy to talk about and took conference realigning within our ODAC that, right. that I was a piece of. So a lot of things culturally and essentially you come up with this blueprint that you feel like, you know, these are things that we know to happen every single year and we're building on those things, you know, in development. Um, and then, so we finished a good 2019 year, which we're a little disappointed at the ending, but, but, but happy to progress. And then, I had a crazy motivated group as far as what I could like feel, you know, heading into that spring and when COVID hit. And so that, that was a challenge in itself, just like the, the, the halting of the momentum and then the unknowns. Um, the, the next step, I think, was just like the players. You know, I kept saying that you know, when they finally did return, we, you know, if, you have, if you've had coaches on here talk about the, you know, practicing with at distance and technical with masks on and, yeah. small groups we did all of that as well so you know we did the best that we could with it um but you know you're 
you know, I, I was impressed by the players in this, but it's also a challenge. Like they had to deal with some sort of adult decisions as young adults. And I, I never wanted to let that kind of go over my head that that's something they were dealing with. I mean, even like, you know, coach, we're on break and I might go home, but am I going to get my parents sick? Like, what's yeah. the deal with all of this, you know? And everyone had their different opinions on how it should be, but I think that was like a heavy weight um, that I was impressed by the way our guys kind of just got on with it and sort of the decisions that they made. You know, you have these contact tracing decisions. So um, the blueprint being changed and then having this hybrid fall um, that just trying to figure things out. And we had freshmen, two freshman recruits that fall that, spent two days on campus and then had to go to an isolation dorm for 14 days. Oh my God. Two, two days into getting here, you know? So it's like, and you're trying to build a culture of usually yeah. in the fall, this is your culture time. This is yeah. your preseason. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're moving forward. So that was challenging. The ODAC played a spring season. So at that point you get to, are we happy to be playing or are these competitive juices being turned on where like, Hey, if this is a real season, we're going about this in a real way, but yeah. then there's like a point of like, hey, we spent, you know, 10 months not playing any soccer besides, you know, small sided six on six stuff. And we're, we're allowed to have these games and we're excited about it. And so that's what I thought of balance on that one, like how much to make sure that it's not fun, but, you know, we're, we're about enjoyment of the game here anyway. So that was a piece to it. And sure, as you could predict unpredictability, we finally get to, our first match we're supposed to play in the spring of that year. And uh, I got the guys socially distanced in a room before we get on a bus to be, you know, organized where they're supposed to sit next to their roommates. And in between time, they're in this holding room separated and I'm going to put them on this bus. I get a phone call that the game is canceled. Don't get on the bus. There's an issue on the other side with contact tracing and coronavirus. So it's like 10 months to like this, hey, guys, sorry, we're not going. Coach, you're kidding us, right? So <laughs> we uh, we just had a whole bunch of those throughout that spring. I mean, I don't think we played any of the games with the full roster. Um, mm -hmm. We had three games canceled within two hours of the kickoff for different reasons. And so, again, I think everyone had to deal with it. Some teams didn't get to play at all. You know, I, I'm, I'm well understanding of that. Um, but that was a challenge. And so I think um, – I think that was that was the year in itself. And then we did go fairly hard at the guys we had that spring. So then you're wondering what's the impact going to be on a spring season like that's eight to ten games next to a fall season, which was this yeah. past fall, you know. And um, so, yeah, again, it was it was a challenge. And like we're, we're still seeing the repercussions of it in that like. So I've got some fifth year senior guys coming back next year, a whole handful of them, well, mm -hmm. nine of them, actually, which I'm excited about. But mm -hmm. They're the only ones that have seen what used to be a full segment of a fall season to a winter segment to a spring season to a summer to a fall the normal way. Yeah. No one else. And it was weird to think even my juniors, they were freshmen who had yeah. gotten to the point of that spring season and then everything shut down. Mm -hmm. So even this spring season we're about to go into, only a couple of guys know what that looks like yeah. normally, you know, yeah. so yeah. – that's a culture reset that, that there was the passing down of that. And so, yeah. again, I could talk on it. It was challenged, but um, learned a lot, learned a lot about how to deal with adversities. I think players and myself and adaptability, I would say more than anything else, just yeah. be happy to be playing, enjoy it, get on with it and uh, don't take it for granted. I, I think that's the, you said it adaptability. Like I'm amazed at how adaptable everyone became just by necessity. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's that's probably a, a remarkable thing about you. You never realize how how flexible people can be unless they're put in that position, right? Yeah. Um, hey, let me because you mentioned it, and let me just shift over. You know, you you talked about team culture and building a culture, and I know we were going back and forth via email. Um, like, how important is that for you? And and. You know, what are some things that you might be doing that encourage it or strengthen it, especially now, I would suspect, re yeah. redefining it, right? Because you had this crazy gap year and a half or whatever it was, two years. 
Yeah, I mean, some of the sort of program, I'll call them rites and rituals, but things that we do, you know, like a practice or in locker room or in travel or in training, you know, like, um, or off the field as well, you know, some of those things, they, they became challenged when, the, you know, in, in, in a in a nutshell, team culture is relationships and yeah. being around each other and shared uh, beliefs and values and things like that. And we spent a year having to tell them not to be around each other. You know, <laughs> you can't be near each other or else we're going to get in trouble as a team. Yeah. You know, so don't do that. So, you know, just trying to just trying to build in some of those processes that we already have. I mean, we, we do some things here that I don't think are too dissimilar to maybe other places, but I think are effective. We you know, players give presentations in the preseason on our team sort of values and beliefs. And um, uh, I think that's always, to me, been pretty impactful um, in terms of uh, preparation for the season. I mean, we had and hopefully still will rely on upperclassmen and a leadership group and players that have gone through the cycle to, you know, hold the accountability line on certain things within the program that we believe to be valuable in the culture. Um, taking time to do things sort of off the field, I'd say that's one that we're, it's a tough one. <laughs> I, has, I always tell my assistants, I mean, we'll take a day or two in preseason a lot of times and do something else. Um, mm -hmm. Every four years we go on an international trip and that that takes care of the whole thing. But, you know, whether it's uh, whitewater rafting or just uh, going paintballing this past mm -hmm. you know, fall and it's like, I only got 10 days to prepare you guys. Yeah. So <laughs> as a coach, I'm like, eh, but I, I don't want to give this day up, you know, this yeah. two day up or whatever. But in the big picture of it, it's, I think the value of it is way more important than, than a day when you're looking at a, you know, a long, long-term season or, you know, culture of a group moving forward. So um, yeah, there's a couple other things we have. We'll invite alumni to speak to the team. Often I try to, I'm fortunate because I am an alumni that I know a lot of the guys and where they might be able to share some leadership on or some insight on, you know, previous teams experiences or their personal experiences. Um, yeah. So that would be another thing, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, I could go on and on with like little things that we do day to day, but uh, generally speaking, I think it's just, just like identifying what the values of, us are all the time and then what are specifically important to that group yeah. in an individual year and then making sure that we're carrying those ones each year adding more in or sort of being fluid with the things that we find important for the yeah. group that we're dealing with i get that i i get that that's always an it's an ongoing process right because the minute you stop focusing in on it is the minute it all falls apart yes. um, and so you gotta you gotta work at it but you know you've been at um roanoke what since 2012 i think i read um is like how long do you think as a new coach did it take you to get to a point where you thought you had established a a framework for the kind of program that you wanted to to run i think it's a little different here for me because i took over for someone that i played for who i had a lot of shared values with and i think the the, uh, some of the values in the program had persisted, even though my 15 years or whatever before coming back, however many it was. I, I would say that, you know, I, I think four years, just like a cycle of a recruit would be something that I, you know, kind of would identify to say like, hey, these are all people that saw your whole recruiting process through, mm -hmm. you know, like, what does that look like? You know, and like, yeah. even from that, the way that a player treats a recruit on a visit, you know, like that could be something that each program culturally has different, you know? And so like, like, anyway, I could get into our process there, but like, so that's one where until you're recruited by people that are in the structure mm -hmm. of how it is or the culture of how it is, then you might not be able to know how it is. So yeah. I, I think four years, I mean, I felt pretty comfortable fairly early on, not to say there wasn't things that I was trying to bring in ideas that I had to the program here and that we're not always still trying to fix and upgrade and, 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 deal with but um you know i i think you know in terms of this off-field culture i think three to four years probably here i felt pretty comfortable with like you know the process in which we were going yeah. forward not to say that i wasn't comfortable with the groups that i had yeah, yeah. early on either yeah yeah but you weren't like totally coming into a completely new environment new That's right. you were just trying to revamp um 
you know, I asked this a few times and I, I get varying answers, but do you, just in terms of your team and your program, do you have any like non-negotiables that you tell the players? Like, look, if you're going to be a part of this program, here are the one, two, 10, 20 things that you must. Yeah. So we have like, you know, probably I would, maybe it's not every program, but we have like administrative rules, you know, athletic department rules. And then we have team rules. The team rules are not that, not that, you know, big, but they're, they're sort of, they are non-negotiable, at mm -hmm. least in terms of a repercussion uh, of some sort, like a set thing. Um, mm -hmm. But then we would also have like, like core values within the program and then team values within that, that version of the team, that, mm -hmm. that journey that that group is going on in that year. Mm -hmm. And so like, while those are a little bit, they're, they're not more gray, but they're, they're more fluid, those values. It's like, this is what we aspire to be. I would say that they're a little bit harder to say are non-negotiable, but we do try to build those in as non-negotiable, non-negotiables either kind of year to year or throughout the time. I mean, like, yeah, so I'll give an example. This year's team, you know, punctuality was a big one. Like it, it wasn't a problem, but, but I think they recognized it as a detail of, of excellence maybe like hey so they created this own we got to be everyone's got to be in the locker room 10 minutes before anything that we're doing be it scouting uh training strength and conditioning whatever the case may be um and so you know they're kind of like the team the team value every year is punctuality it's an understatement understood that mm -hmm. you got you know if you're not if you're not early or late you got to be on time but then this was like taking it another step that they wanted to hold each other accountable for believing mm -hmm. it, it was a you know a small detail so you know for this season that was kind of a non-negotiable and to be fair i mean i might be going a little bit too much into uh i can share it but we like broke early uh not broke the whole year broke at the very last game, the day of the last game to where we had to suspend a player for the first half of a game who, of our ODAC tournament game, which we ultimately um, didn't win, but but it was, this is what it is. This is what we said we we're gonna do. And my heart went for the player. This is a simple mistake, not a, in my, my belief to it, simple yeah, mistake yeah. of an older player who had very few yeah. mishaps along the way but that was the thing this year we said yeah. this is what we're about this is what we're going to do and when we missed it this was the consequence that we had already determined and so um yeah so that that would be one i think for this year i mean again cultural values year to year we, we have i got words i think everybody has that. these words are on the walls what do they mean but like competitive team first value uh team first um family and work rate i mean those would be yeah. four that are it's hard to judge the non-negotiableness of it but those yeah, are yeah, yeah. the aspirations you know yeah, and i would yeah. say the team first one is probably the hardest one to be a roanoke soccer player without being about uh, at right now um competitive a close second but you know it's I don't know. I, I think maybe part of division three as well. It's like, what are we here doing? We're here yeah. for the team. I mean, this would be a difference in division one to division three. We're like got guys who are, I'm here to be a pro. I'm here to develop, to be a pro. I mean, that's even yeah. changing a little bit. I think where they're um, going pro more often out of high school now than even going into division one yeah. or into college soccer. But, but for a guy here, if you don't value that experience as a team and yeah. you're willing to, you know, serve the team in a capacity can't doesn't mean you can't have individual ambition or or uh confidence for sure but uh i think that would be a challenge to play here if you didn't have that so that would be something we talk about in the recruiting process and i think a cultural value that maybe has persisted mm -hmm. um all right so it's i'm always curious because some depending on the team you get a, you to get a different answer, but do you, do you, how much effort do you go in throughout the season to pre to to prepare for individual teams that you're playing, or do you just focus mostly on this is how we play, this is how we're going to play, and and you're just going to go you're that's that's your approach as you go into different games. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think it's a it's a question that like you know everybody's 
not struggling with, but having to make decisions on. I, I would say I have probably changed a little bit since my time at Roanoke on that. Um, I would say earlier on, maybe I was leaning more to the side of this is what we do and you got to deal with it, uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. if we're doing it well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe more recently, um, 17, 18, 19, we've been a little bit more adept to, um, uh, it's not necessarily change things, but like uh, try to understand sort of risk versus reward in the way that we're going to approach a game um, in certain games, I guess. And uh, a lot of that would come from, quite honestly, like the amount of value we would have on having the ball. Um, I think early on, I was like, I put a higher rate of value on that. And I think in a lot of games it worked very well, but what I was finding was that in like other games that were the bigger games, I would say against the top teams, right. it was um, not necessarily the factor that was the, that, uh, the main determiner of the outcome, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was more about, I hate to say like, not putting yourself in risk, but when you're playing athletic high pressing teams, um, there's a certain amount of like risk that, you know, you'd want to maybe on that day yeah. alleviate with your players. And so yeah. I think we've become a little bit more hybrid in that way. Um, I also think that like, I do judge that kind of season to season based on who we have and what we have and kind of how we're going to play though. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have in a DNA that stays s somewhat similar each year with trying to find like ways to perfect that. Yeah. Okay, so you 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 play in a, I mean, in a pretty competitive conference, right? I mean, a Final Four team, Washington and Lee, yep. um, was there, uh, is is in the ODAC. You know, I, it's something that I've been thinking about is how 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 tough of it is it throughout a season when you get into conference play. How how difficult is it because you're going from game, you know, two days later, you got another game against and you don't get much of a breather. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, uh, I think, for any of the you know teams that are in leagues where like kind of anyone can beat anyone on any given day. Um, yeah, you got to be prepared and uh, it, it does become a grind and a challenge. Um I guess there's the, the, the positives about being in conferences like that too, you know, is that you, you are prepared and challenged in, in those same ways. Um, I, I do always say that it's, it's a bit different and this is, it's not a knock, but when I played in the ODAC, it, it was a little bit more, um, I think I call it like, top heavy, if you will, like um, parity wasn't across the whole board, which is more so what I would say it is now. And so, yeah, it, it's a challenge. Um, throw in there and I, I don't know if you have you know if you have any insight into this or not but we uh so so in 2014 we went uh, 15 and 2 and lost in the ODAC finals to uh, Lynchburg and we, we didn't get an at large bid into the NCAA tournament thought we had a great team and um it was due to like our strength of schedule number w w was too low and so that had actually happened to a Randolph team the year before and a couple other teams um, in the ODAC, like in a certain decade of time. Um, right. And what actually we figured out was that we were the largest uh, league in the country at that time with, uh, mm -hmm. I think, 13 or 12 teams. I, I think USA South was right there with us, but one of the two largest leagues. And that's a bad, um, it's a bad math problem to your SOS number, the more league games that you play. So myself and a couple other coaches in the league um, did some digging on this and uh, actually realized that the ACC had done the same thing in Division One soccer for the same sort of problem. It was more their RPI number, but our strength of schedule number, which is like sort of the highest weighted uh, determiner to at large bids, you know, in the committee's minds. Um, we we don't play everyone in our league anymore. We, we, we switched it. And since we made that switch, we've gotten two teams into the tournament or multiple right. teams into the tournament each year since then. I, I say all that to say that it's, it is a highly competitive league. And we felt like we were a little undervalued at that time because the math problem of the, of the, the league was, was hurting us with like sort of our ability to get 
multiple teams on the national stage. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited when we're able to get multiple teams, obviously we want to be one of them, but like, um, that's been big. It has skewed the conference standings to a certain extent because you don't play everyone. Um, so, you know, depending on the matchups on a given, given year, it, it, it could play different based on who you play or who you don't play. And, you talk about get being able to get into things and go down a rabbit hole. I mean, I know more about this math problem than <laughs> anyone will ever want to hear. Um, and there's other factors that are involved with it too. You got to win the games. You got to win your non-conference games. You got to play good teams. But we were, we were just in a point where back then where we had done some number crunching where it wouldn't have mattered. You know, the, I think in 2014, I think Messiah was the team maybe that was undefeated. We could have played them in our seven non-conference games yeah. each time. And our SOS number still wouldn't have been quite high enough to yeah. get us in just because of the 13-team conference and the way that the math yeah, eats yeah. on itself. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's a battle. And, you know, I'd say on top of the fact that you have um, – good teams you have these rivalry games within the league as well which i think is a lot of fun and should be promoted in division three as well i mean i can say for us specifically you know we go to our our neighbors north of us at wnl and that's going to be a, a a great great battle with you know yeah. highly attended game i'd say both places mm -hmm. um same could be said for lynchburg and roanoke and i think in terms of all sports you know you've got hampton city and randolph macon that's going to be a, a big a big game no matter what and there's there's other little rivalries within our leagues you know um that are great ones so that throws even more sort of fuel to the fire of like the outcomes of the matches yeah how how many teams do you now play in in conference and are they is it like i don't want to say randomized but do yeah. you uh oh, man uh i'm happy to answer this so <laughs> we're go we went from we played eight last year uh-huh we're moving to 10 this year we were at nine the year before. We, we, we added a team to our league in Averett starting mm -hmm. next year, and we lost the team in Emory and Henry, who went Division two. Mm -hmm. So each year that this has happened, we've had to kind of switch how we've done it. And mm -hmm. so it's been a kind of uh, the, the golf posts have kept moving, so, yeah. so to speak, on what we want to do. Uh, I'm personally not convinced that 10 is – good enough um that's my personal opinion um because uh -huh. the last time we played 10 was in 2018 and we did not get two teams in that year but all okay. of the other years we've played nine or eight we yeah. have um i think a lot of that does determine well again if, if we could all win enough non-conference games yeah. and whoever the team is needs to win big games as well and yeah. aware of that so we'll be at uh, 10 next year and is it is it you you don't i mean when they go in and you start working the schedule is it yeah. Like I said, is it just sort of like this year you're playing Washington and Lee and then next year you might not? Yeah, you're asking all the great questions. Um, it was it was it was it's done differently like that as well. But it was at first staggered on results from the previous two years mm -hmm. and then sort of snaked evenly across that. So mm -hmm. if you were first place of the last two years, you were in a one spot and then went mm -hmm. one, two, three. So you would play an even number of those yep. allotment of teams. Um, it's switching next year as a sort of a comeback to the 10 games where the higher you were in that order, the harder of a conference schedule that you have. Uh, yeah. So if you're in the top four spots, you're going to guarantee you play those other top four teams four, two, and yeah. you might only play one of the two who are in the lower spots oh, there. Yeah. Um, and it has also been like that. Four years ago, we did the same thing like that. Where So some years it's been evenly balanced and some years it's been yeah. where We've done different things like that. Yeah, because I would think that's where you get snake bit, right? Where if you're if your draw, if it was randomized and your draw just ends up ha happening to be yes. the lower half yep. for the lower 10, like that, that becomes problematic for the math, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, at the end of the day, you, you, like you can't guarantee how anybody's going to be. So it is based on previous results. And now yeah. we threw COVID in there as well, which was like, you know, <laughs> a, a, a two year separation between seasons. But yeah, um, yeah it, it, there's, there's no perfect solution. I mean, no. I guess kudos to the athletic directors and the coaches who have like, everybody wants what's best for their own programs, obviously. And so that doesn't all match exactly right, you yeah. know, with, with the, the differences um, on that. But uh, everybody's been, 
in our league has been like willing to have the discussion and um, I think creative in our approach to to try to you know grow our league and promote our league. Yeah. Um, that, let me let me ask, and, and especially coming out, you just mentioned again the COVID year and everything that's going and, and everything that sort of went on and that you dealt with. What what were your expectations for the fall? Right, because you don't yeah. have you, you. You've there's so much, you know, n- non-continuous work that it's. Yeah, I would just. I'm curious about that. Yeah, I would say there was. So every year, coaches' expectations to try to get the players to believe is, uh, perform at our best, develop to our potential, be, be well at the end of the season. Um, you know. Grow, grow to our potential, you know, every day, the cliche, mm-hmm. every single day, just get better. That's that's what we're messaging, what we're trying to say. Uh, when you come off of a season like 2019 with this sort of shift of COVID in between, you know, I don't think there's anything in our players' minds that that wasn't like, hey, we want to be back in the NCAA tournament again. And right. um, we have we have I've done – a decent amount in my tenure here in terms of we've won a regular season of our league and we've been the NCAA tournament. I think we've had some some undefeated regular season years, but we haven't won the tournament yet either. So that was kind of on a goal of, of my guys this year, which was a Hodak tournament championship, um, kind of control our own destiny. Um, so I'd say that's kind of my ambitions were, let's see how good we can be, their ambitions. And I'm you know, joining in that as well. It's like, hey, that's that's the goal to be where we want to be. Right. Um, but then you still have that balance. And again, nobody's saying we're out here to have fun, but happy to be playing a mm-hmm. full season and then, um, you know, s- like make the most of what we're able to do because there were so many unknowns going on to, into it as well still. You know, there was still not the guarantee that we weren't going to have to miss games. There wasn't the guarantee. We we're still wearing masks, you know, on the buses and then, Imposing. This is still a lot going on there, and um, yeah. So I, I say, you know, that was kind of the ambition and the expectation is pretty high, but like the, the process to get there, I think, doesn't really change in terms of like here's what we have and here's what we're going to go after trying to do through this three month period. I, I've I've often forgotten it was in hindsight, like going into the fall, there was no guarantees of anything. No guarantees, like, and it, you know. it, it actually like it seemed real normal. And then it shifted like right before also, like there was like a little bit of a worry about what it was going to be like. And um, I I would say, again, throw in there that throw in there that we had played eight or 10 games in the spring and the unknowns about what that was going to do in terms of like player load, I guess, if you want to call it that or like fatigue or burnout or maybe better. Like, hey, this is better. We're 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 able to train more closer to the Mm -hmm. season. But. Again, no one had the blueprint on that. I didn't have it anyway. So it was like uh, that was like a thing that I think maybe tapered expectations in some way just because there was unknowns to it. Yeah, yeah. So from a soccer perspective, what were some of the pieces of the puzzle that you weren't sure of? You know, like everyone scoring, I know, is always a big issue. But yeah, I mean, if we looked at our season specifically, that was our that was our issue. Um, it was one of the more lower productive scoring seasons that we've had since, since I've been here, especially in terms of scoring in the run of play. Um, I mean, I have some statistics on efficiency that says that we created and generated as many chances as we've had in other seasons, but um, that's the way that it went. So, um, th- th- you know, what I have anticipated, that was going to be a, a, a major challenge. Maybe I underestimated that in some ways. And, you um, you know, we, we had sort of an autocorrect in, in, in the season to try to figure that one out. Maybe more we could have identified it a little bit earlier. I thought we would be good defensively, and we were maybe better than I thought we were defensively. When they conceded 10 goals, that was that's uh, second in program history, I think, here, um, which was a, a big step. And if you look at, like, uh, across the board, the teams that are, you know, Winning yeah. our league, winning the NCAA tournament, yeah. you know that that's a that's a number that ranks right there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's even, impressive. Even goals per game. So that yeah. that part was, um, you know, we were hard to beat this year. Mm-hmm. We just, I, I think, yeah, we talked about it with the guys at the end of the season. I think 
I think three goals in, on the season. It's crazy. Put us in the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. So strength of schedule number was just there. Yeah. Um, three goals, which is three more wins. Mm -hmm. um, it, one would have to have been the right one. Gives yeah. us another ranked opponent. Gives us a whole bunch of things. We, we have a shot. But then you go without those three goals and – you're feeling like, yeah, hey, we're questioning a lot and we got some improvement to do moving forward. So I think that's the, the life of a program and, you know, trying to sort out what what uh, what the next moves are. I always look at the ties, right? Like is can, if you could score a goal to break the tie, what's that do for the season? Right. And then and I've done some work with some coaches on separate to this that. Um, taking a look at that, okay, if you could just have increment, if you could just increase your scoring output by X, yep. what would have the impact be if you pick the right games, obviously? And by and large, it's always that. It's not like you need 20 more goals. No, it's you need you need those two, three, yeah. four goals, and your season totally flips, right? Like yep. it just suddenly becomes. Um, you know, like you said, maybe you're on the cusp of the NCAA or it becomes an you become an optional team at that point for an at large. Um, what surprised you the most is, again, same thing coming out of covid and you don't know how these guys are going to react. And for all the. Crap that they've been yeah. through, what surprised you? Uh, I mean, the defending didn't surprise me, but I was pleased with it. I mean, it, it was exciting piece. The fact that we were we were pretty stingy and um um yeah so i guess that piece i guess it maybe exceeded my expectations in some ways and excited about that i think um our guys did a great job i give a lot of credit to assistant coaches as well works with our goalkeepers austin rose and uh main assistant sheldon blue he works with our backslot just did a tremendous job with those guys um it, again, I, it was built into the culture, I think, prior to COVID. I think COVID might have jumped it, but just resiliency, group resiliency was not surprising, but also like exciting. It, it, again, even though we didn't sort of reach goals, we did reach a goal of like enduring the season and still being, I felt like still improving as the season went on this year and guys being excited to go after it. I mean, the, the end of our year was such a letdown and I, you know, I, I have been, I guess, fortunately not here, but it, it, maybe earlier in my coaching career with groups that you kind of feel like, ah, I'm ready for this one to be over, or they are ready for this one to be over. And that, that was not the case with my group this year. Um, the resiliency, I think, also went for, uh, I'll give it one story. We we had a player, Alec Tadigui, who got called into uh, the, a the Guam senior national team, and he played two matches in the middle of our season. So, I knew it was going to happen before the season started, um, but he's a key player for us. And so he was gone maybe 12 days, including three games, right in the heart of our league season mm -hmm. this year. Um, and he went to Bahrain and Guam played against Cambodia and two Asian Cup qualifiers. And I mean, amazing experience for him. Super proud. He, he played full 90 twice. This is the first, yeah. I think, Roanoke player that's ever played on a senior men's national team. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple guys um, play on youth national teams over the years, mostly international players. Uh, so just great opportunity and experience. And um, but like, you know, you, you you lose a big player in the middle of the season, especially as maybe that's. Um, a time when you're hoping to get your sort of mojo going, you know, f figuring out some things about yourself in the early part of the non-conference. And then um, that was like the first three games of our conference, I think, or, or second, third and fourth. And so, um, yeah, that was a challenge. But again, resiliency of the players to sort of next man up and just get on with it. And I was really pleased with the, the group in that way to just keep moving forward. And even when the goals weren't coming, like the collective, like, go out and work on it more. Like, let's just keep going after it. And so you, you, you get heartbroken when the results don't come in the way from the work that's being put in and the, the energies that's kept in the right way. But I, I like to think that it's it's all kudos to the players, but it's mm -hmm. the culture they kept that didn't allow the, the, the train to go off the track, so to speak, when you have to deal with some adversity like that. And you also have to deal with some sort of soccer gods not giving it yeah. to you for a little bit. So. <laughs> That's always that's always the uncontrollable, right? Like 
how the soccer gods are going to treat you on any given day. Hey, I really want to talk about some of the st statistics, and maybe this is a good segue, but, you know, based on your schedule and actually looking at some of your statistics, you know, it looks like going on the road was a bit of a challenge for you. You only had one loss, but you had four ties. You ended up with four ties, I think. Um, although I, I will say credit to you, right? Like you went on the road against a very, 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 very good Washington and Lee team. So not not to take away from there, but what what do you think that challenge was? Was there do you, do you, aside from the fact that you didn't have the yeah. score of the goals, but yeah, so I was thinking about that uh, a lot because you're you're always trying to prepare for the next year and like, hey, what what is it about that? You know that that what is it? Yeah, you know, is it is it something on the field? Is it in the travel? Um, I mean, the way the schedule worked out this year, those were tough games. So I, I have felt like I haven't done our team a lot of justice chasing this SOS number in the last mm -hmm. six years with some of the trips that we've gone on. I mean, one of the things that is difficult about our location, um, Roanoke is a fantastic place, uh, but we're not near to a lot of colleges. You're out there. That's the ones in our league. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I think a lot of us in the South region deal with this as well, where you're, it's not like if you're in New Jersey where you could find like other regionally ranked opponents yeah. in an hour trip, both yeah. in your league and also out of your league. So we've had to do some trips that are challenging over the years. We went and played um, Rowan up in Maryland at a neutral site game a couple of years ago. Yeah. We played um, Salisbury, same thing in a neutral site game, just trying to get these games in. And sometimes these are, we're going up and back three, four, five hours, which is, is scientifically soccer wise, not the thing to do, but yeah. it's like we have to have the game. So this year it, it was kind of no different um, in terms of the non-conference. Um, the one game was Emory. We played them in a neutral site down in Charlotte at a um, at Charlotte Soccer Academy's uh, yeah. North Carolina Sportsplex and great environment and um, tough 1-0 loss. But I, I, there wasn't a ton in the game. I thought a, a, a draw might have been fair that day. They're a very good team. Um, so that was just, a, just a, you know, we go down and back three and a half hours. They yeah. got to do the same thing for that one. Um, our two two of our draws in league are the furthest trips you can make in league. And again, they got to do the same thing to us next year, but traveling to Virginia Wesleyan and traveling to Randolph Macon are both three and a half hour or plus yeah. trips that you make. And so um, there might be something to that though. Mm -hmm. We have a saying like any environment, any conditions, any day, be prepared for success. So there's no excuse to it because it is what it is. But, you know, as I look at it, th th a lot of those results were against good teams in long trips. Yeah. Um, so uh, figuring that out with the balance of academics and could we go over the night before, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, things yeah. like that is always the division the three dilemma in some ways. And um, um, so, yeah, I think there was something to that, just the, 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 the tougher games on yeah. those trips in some ways. Um, St. Mary's was another one that we lost one zero two early in the season at Salisbury's tournament. Now we were already up there um, and, played a, a tough game versus Salisbury on the Saturday. And, we, and then we had to turn around and play St. Mary's in a great game on Sunday and um, lost one zero. So, you know, that was kind of it. So I think if I could help my guys by scheduling, it would help us a little bit. And then maybe, um, you know, we, we're always looking at little yeah. things we can do to make yeah. the travel, you know, as seamless as possible yeah. so that we can, you know, produce when we get there. Yeah. It, it is a big deal though, the travel, like you don't, like there is something physical, uh, physical, mental that is not resolved easily when you have to travel. I mean, the professionals are are doing it, right. Like, you know, even MLS trying to go, they want all charter planes and all, all to reduce the stress that you put on your body and your mind from from a travel perspective. And if you're just sitting on a bus for the most part for four hours that's that's tough and i remember my days we had the small little buses you know yeah. or vans and those things were brutal but yeah i mean i think we're developed a lot in a lot of ways even you know in college soccer in general at the it's at all of the divisions you've we've developed at like kind of the understanding of like you know trying to peak performance in matches but um 
and it's especially different than when I even play, like kind of the same things you're talking about, you know, taking vans to games yeah. as opposed to charter buses would be one yeah. thing, you know, that could be different at some points. But uh, credit to Division Three athletes. I mean, that, that this would be a difference. Like, I know what to do for a Division One men's soccer player to – sort of say this is what is the best case scenario for you to be at your peak performance yeah. in terms of monitoring their load heading into yeah. the game, what they should eat before the game, being able to produce that. We traveled a tremendous amount at Denver. I mean, we had like all yeah. sorts of systems in place yeah. to try to, you know, peak performance. Um, and, you know, my guys are going to class all day and then <laughs> on the bus and going to a game or going straight from class to the locker room for the game, sometimes yeah. showing up the last minute that they can yeah to prepare themselves not not a four hour before pregame meal every single time yeah. so these yeah. are some things i was like ah, you know we've brought in some of these qualities in i think like yeah. you're asking me about the division one thing yeah some of them they're just not not feasible yeah. at the divisional level i say all that to say like great determination just yeah. get on with it is still a big part yeah. of we can have all this data all this statistics and we're, we use it all but it's still a lot of times, like a, a bit of who wants it more and whose yeah. who's culture and brotherhood is going to be stronger yeah. on the day. You know, there's a yeah. factor to that, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it's very true. It's very true. There is something, again, going back to the whole idea of being resilient and dealing with this stuff. And it's almost like you forget it because it's a part of your your of the Division three experience. Like you're not. Like you said, kids have to they they have to go to class. Like there's no outs for that, you know. I mean, you might get a dispensation for travel, but right. I think all the professors expect. Look, if you're not tra like you better you better be in class. So um, yeah. Um, so I got to ask because you sent over, and I'm not gonna, you know, I won't show them, but um, you, you sent over some really, really interesting information that you've collected on your teams in each year and sort of your games from a statistics perspective, attacking, defending, restarts, you know, the efficiency, you know, efficiency analysis that you've done on scoring goals, run of play, all that kind of stuff. So I, I have to ask, when did you start tracking this type of data? on your team and are you a new billy are you the billy bean of division three soccer <laughs> I am not. this is a first like yeah. these are i don't want to say it's a first like i know guys other coaches have tracked it but this is like serious like serious yeah I, I mean i i think this so there's there's a couple of things to it the, the first is like understanding w how we can use what we can use is still a process and um so, you know, I, I'm not saying that, it, again, I know everything because I even know what I know from this data, you know, but it's like application of it. But in some form, we've, I've been sort of aware of tracking some of these things, like since I've been coaching and I've mostly taken things from other people the whole time, if I'm being honest, like, like, um, so there's sort of two, two form, like two kind of fields, I would say that. Uh, maybe a couple more, but two maybe main ones. One I would call it the critical factors that we've tracked over the years. Mm -hmm. The other one is like this scoring efficiency. Yeah. The critical factors one is a little bit more like sports information uh, driven. Like yeah. you could figure this out about your team, um, and you could uh, you could track other teams on this for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes of, you know, that comes of. Kind of when you have that innate, you know, guys who've coached a lot of soccer, uh, I think all coaches, especially like youth coaches, even like high school coaches who coach just a ton of games over their careers, they have a couple of these things that they believe to be true. Yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. if we, That's me. <laughs> yeah, if we score in the first five minutes of the game, yeah. like anytime the other team scores, it's, it's the next five minutes is the most important time yeah. in the game, you know, and they're true because you've seen it happen so many times. Well, some of those either coaches I work for or myself with them, we started tracking that, that stuff, like ones that we thought were important. And then you know if it really is or not. So the ones for that, like for us right now at Roanoke, and this could switch year to year, but we, you know, we, we're tracking like first goal, um, consecutive goals, 
what I call critical moment goals, which uh, maybe I don't want to give the proprietary information on exactly <laughs> what those are, but those you could probably yeah. make a guess as to yeah. what those are. And um, and uh, like shutouts would be a piece to that as yeah. well, which is a pretty simple one. Like but as we've tracked it, like for instance, first goals. So since I've been at Roanoke, we're, we're 76 wins, one loss and six ties if we score the first goal. It's huh. It's crazy. It's it's like and so so yeah. So that's one of the areas, um, and those would be things that I thought that I knew, and that we've tracked now, and yeah. we've found to be true. Um, you know, I can talk about how we use these next. The other one is the the shooting efficiency, and this is something a little bit more new to me, maybe in the last five to seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and I I can't take credit at all for this, and I'm going to give the credit to. A friend of mine named Mark Simpson, who he, he just spent about a year and a half, two years with Charlotte MLS as their director of soccer analytics. But right. um, prior to that, he, he ran a youth club in North Carolina and he also um, was doing some consulting for MLS teams and just in, I think in his own uh, interests um, had had. I got I to gotta be careful how much I put out there of what he's done and what this <laughs> is. But he tracked every shot in many of the major European and, and MLS um, mm -hmm. leagues for almost a 10 year period, every shot. Okay. And he's created a, a, a model which can tell you the efficiency based on a few factors of that shot location and some mm -hmm. other things. And this would be the proprietary piece that I don't want to share, but we we're fortunate enough that out of our friendship and he's another guy that I just talk a lot of soccer with uh, he shared that with me and we started tracking our and our opponents on these same factors. Right. Yeah. So I have a, our numbers have met, matched the world's pretty much in some of our opponents pretty, yeah. pretty um, exactly. And so something that we kind of know um, what an efficient shot looks like. And again, I would say if I asked any good coach to explain what a good efficient shot to look like, they would probably get it pretty close to right. They would yeah. go, yeah, this is, that's an obvious, this is where yeah. those goals were scored and these are yeah. where they are. not But we have the numbers on it and now we have our numbers on it and we have our opponent's numbers on mm -hmm. it. So that that is, um, you know, those are two things that we've tracked and they've helped on both sides of the ball. I think mm -hmm. the efficiency one, um, you know, I also know what an inefficient shot looks like. So from a defending standpoint, our guys are able to know, you know, if we can do this, this, and this, yeah. we're not even worried. And so I if started, we can force a player into a certain position and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you, you, you can probably say it all just without yeah. the numbers. And um, like, so that has also helped us to, you know, you, you see a, there's other coaches that do this different. I'm sure they say, we want to put up the most shots we can in a game. Yeah. And that's a, a, I think there's a, slight value to that maybe in our division of play compared to the professionals with the uh, mm -hmm. keeper error or just yeah. the ability for like kind of player error but our numbers say otherwise so if we get out shot 20 to 10 but there are zero efficient shots in that game i don't lose sleep over that box score that the sports information mm -hmm. director has yeah. i lose sleep if they're creating efficient shots that i know are going to go in at uh, 20 percent or higher and that's the most efficient run of play shot that yeah. that we have so um yeah so we, it helps us on both sides of the ball and then the critical factors um it's more of a mentality thing i'd say than anything else that we would build into our training like again we know the first goal is important to us i've had to try to figure out a lot of reasons of why, why that is like i don't stop coaching when we score for sure but it's like a piece but you know we would say you know again something any coach would do hey Today's session, when we're playing at the end, is first goal wins. Or if you score yeah. the consecutive goals, they're going to be worth four goals or yeah, yeah. something like that. So the mentality of like the importance of these things, we can build mm -hmm. it that way. So that that's interesting that you 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 talked about something that one of the several reasons I started this channel is because over the fall I'd watched two hundred some odd games. I I. I tracked, I started tracking passing because I asked the fundamental question because I have a very, a very defined view of how I think the game should be played. And so I was just trying to prove, am I right? Or is it just a feeling or right? And so I started tracking passing, passing efficiency. And I 
what have you. And um, yes, passing does matter. And especially as you look at teams and how good they are relative to their to other schools, it's a it's it's a significant factor. Right. And Messiah can hold on to the ball, as you well know, right, like can hold on to the ball better than anybody. And that usually translates into wins for them. Right. Um, but anyhow, so all of this stuff to me was is is a is a is a gold mine just from a standpoint of again proving those things that I have in uh, beliefs in my head, um, and I, I actually looked at goals and restarts. So we'll 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 talk about that. Um, but you know, you have all these insights, and th this is where I don't get to do it except make a video. You have all these insights now into your team, into opponents. Like, how do you use this? How do you use this stuff? Or, I mean, aside from the informational aspect to it, I mean, do you do you take a look at this and say, okay, so we got again the easy one that you mentioned is scoring first, and how how important statistically it is to score first? Um, do you do, are there other ways in which you you apply this data to your actual, I'll just say training or games? Yeah, so like I said, the critical factors ones are a little bit more mentality based than the fit scoring efficiency mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how we would apply it to training. I mean, I think there's an awareness of like match management that goes along with it. So that might be either in training or even in game, like, you know, sort of momentum or, or what have you. Um, yeah, I, got, I could go deeper into that, but I, generally speaking, I'd say that like the critical factors is is more built into the mentality yeah. than it is the tactic, not to say it's not built into the tactic. I mean, yeah. playing in there and early in the game is important if it's possible for us. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the scoring efficiencies, so we've created like – Sometimes game to game or maybe year to year, we'll try to, and I'm, I'm still working at, you know, developing this as well, but like key performance indicators on a game or key performance mm -hmm. indicators in a, on a season yeah. that we want to try to reach, or then they could be applied to a training session as well. And so that might be like generating this amount of efficient shots in a game, you know, yeah. like, or, or we know how many goals we're going to get if we can generate that amount. Right. Um, the how is still the big question you know yeah. and so that that's another piece to it but um you know i like i we share this with we'll, we'll do like uh what after every game the next day like what did we do well what could we have done better if in sort mm -hmm. of phases of the game with the team and try to get some of their feedback sometimes it's me talking at them i probably could do better with that as well but they uh at that point we'll maybe hit on some of these things like hey is there our efficiency numbers mm -hmm. like we just didn't create. Why didn't we create? You know yeah. what it was. Um, we'll use it that way. I think there's a technical piece to it, and that's where I'm at right now, heading into the spring. The guys are going to hear about this when they return on Monday from our spring break, and we get our spring season started. Which is mm -hmm. like, how can we improve technically in the final third to make sure that yeah. the efficient chance doesn't go to waste? And then, what kind of training activity would that be yeah. that would you know help create that? We know where we want to have the ball. And, um, we have a phrase that is upgrade or downgrade the shot. So upgrading the shot would be in combination or on the dribble. It's a way that you upgrade your chance of scoring by creating something yeah. that we know to be um, true. And so, yeah, that would be another way that we would, we would, you know, throw it into training. I, I do try not to like some players like it more than others. And I try not to overload the guys with like, all of this stuff, even if we're tracking it, sometimes I try not to overload myself. I mean, we track it game <laughs> to game, but I could spend a lot of time thinking about this and then yeah. go like what I just talked about, which is play harder than them, you know, <laughs> and like yeah. that's what it is, you know, or like yeah. eat a good meal the night before the game, yeah, yeah. And just, you know, we'll, we'll feel better. Um, so yeah, I think there's a piece to that as well and trying to balance it. And I think, like I said, um, try not to make it overkill, but trying to be informational for the players. And yeah. I think the soccer junkies of it, they love it. They want to hear it. They want to know it, understand it. And yeah. we can put the evidence to, to, uh, to film as well, obviously. Hey, this is an effective shot. This isn't. Um, we, have, we have also started to track efficiency of assists. So I have an idea of that as well now, like where the assists come from. And I saw it kind of did something not too dissimilar and i 
I don't have that well enough to talk about it. We've only done that for like kind of a year and a half now, yeah. but um, I have some ideas on general where they come from yeah. as well. Yeah. That to me, that, so I did a, and maybe that's the one you were referring to. I was like, where do goals come from? Right? Like, I, again, intuitively I have an idea, you know, well, you get it central at some point cause you want to be close to the goal. And, but I just never, how do you get it to that spot, right? Yeah. And I think that's, and it goes back to just a fundamental, again, a theory, which I don't know how to prove or disprove, where I think a lot of teams rely on, in the final third in particular, chaos. They rely on creating a measure of chaos in the other teams and that they can be the beneficiaries of that chaos. The ball bounces somewhere, there's a guy who taps it in rather than being purposeful about how do I get a ball from 40 yards out into a spot where one of my player one of my players is going to be in the best position to score a goal and I don't I again that's just pure my own idea and I think I was trying to resolve that in my own head um to figure out if there is a way to to connect that a little bit more without just sort of like you know like I said, creating a bunch of chaos and hoping you could you could pounce on it. Yeah, well, um, you're speaking to you're speaking to like why we're doing this as well. Why why I care about this as well, which is like like not to rely on the randomness. Yeah, we'll take it, but not to rely on it. Sure, to have, to have in our DNA, and yeah. so again, that, that would be like how you know we can go on it. But yeah, that that's that's essentially what my main and coming from mark who's sort of created these main focus on the whole thing is is to try to understand like what does a good shot look like and how to get the ball there on with your with your ability with your yeah, yeah. with yeah. your intent and again cha chaoticness can be an intent and it can be in a, a very uh impactful yeah. uh, 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 it works the times, yeah. you know, the chaoticness because of sure. the level of player and right. the, air, the, the margin of error from air, mistakes yeah. and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a balance. And I think I've always looked at the game in a certain way. That's where I was saying that I've had to come across maybe you know, c coming up with a little less risk and a little bit more yeah. um, understanding of uh, where to put the other team in some risk. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I still – we're not intending to be able to create goals in the run of yeah. play through our own play. Yeah. Well, I think you said it best, right? Like there is a risk if you just sort of count on the chaos, right? Where, where chaos by definition, there's no certain outcome in any right. which way. And so as a coach and at the way I look at the game is how do you position yourself in the best possible manner to score a goal, regardless of, sort of what the other team brings, right? Like you, you you want to be able to get the ball in a position to score ultimately in a way that is reliant on you, not so much on chance or luck or the yeah. other team breaking down or what have you. Um, that's really where my my head is at. And again, I I'm you have so much more detail than than I do, but it, it, it's a long if I had the if I wasn't looking at a computer screen all the time, like it would be, this would be the sort of fun thing I'd like to dive into just because, um, um, just because I think there's a lot of value that you could get out of this stuff, especially in terms of just understanding the game, right? And and how you're gonna do in the final third or defensively. But so one of those areas is on restarts and set plays. And I, again, it's a, it's a little bit of a theory for me, um, where I think every coach talks about how important restarts and, and set plays are, but they're not, most teams are not good at them. Just because if you look at the balance of goals that they score run a play versus set plays, like it's it's not, it's it's nominal, right? It's not, yep. it's not significant. Yep. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting that you're tracking that and you you had more goals from set plays than you did from run of play, which I'm sure creates a whole other set of issues for you. Like, dang, how do we get? Yeah, don't ask, don't ask me what we're so why we're so good at uh, at set plays because I like that number, but 
but the other number that's not that is off yeah. that is the one that bothers me more you know the yeah so no so i was actually going to ask you like is this not that it's by design that you're hey i just want to score i want to score fewer run of play goals and i want to be better at set plays but i mean how much emphasis do you put on set play training we emphasize it i would say Definitely not more than the other. So not more than scoring them in the run of play or in what I would call like um, uh, defense initiates the attack or like in transition or through pressing. Right. Like like yeah. we kind of think of it in three ways to score: possession with purpose, defense initiates the attack, transition, and then and then on restarts. Mm -hmm. And like what can we be good at in a given year? And then sort of prioritize the time there. That's how I sort of look at it. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm not a set piece expert. I'm trying to develop that skill, you know, year by year and take from other teams and what we see, uh, our numbers were, you know, in having tracked restart goals from national champions and our league champions over the years that they were, they're right there on the, on the list of, um, right there alongside what those higher level teams were doing as, yeah. this year. Um, and, uh, Again, I think we're, we're, you know, we're trying to come up with some creative ways to do that, um, to, to change or improve at that. But if, if I was to say we were like more intentful about something, that would be not in terms of restarts, it would be not conceding on restarts. Because yeah. um, that had bit us in my first maybe four to five years pretty hard. Yeah, reversed. <laughs> yeah, we had played like some some of the bigger games that we played in my first four or five years here. Or I should say this against the better teams that we played mm -hmm. against, there was a span where we were scoring in the run of play and we were conceding goals on restarts. And that was yeah. the way it was going against all of the regionally ranked or nationally ranked teams that we would play. It just ha happened to be like that. So we kind of made a commitment to defending restarts in, you know, all of what that looks like in terms of, um, uh, yeah. Not fouling, not fouling is a, is one way, you know, being able yeah. to clear a ball up the line if, if yeah. versus kicking it out of bounds. And these are yeah. obvious things I think coaches probably talk about. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, the number one way you can be efficient against restarts is not concede penalties. That's a 70% yeah. chance they're going to score, 77% yeah. chance they're going to score. So that, that would be another one. And so we, we we decreased that number to one goal against on restarts yeah. uh, this past year. So that, that was like a positive. And I think that's where we have put time and emphasis over the mm -hmm. past couple of years and trying to lower that through a variety of, of measures and ways in yeah. training. Um, the, the other side of it, it's crazy because I, I can picture three goals this year that we scored which is a tactic that I'm still not really in favor of, but we scored it, which is the ball is a foul at midfield and you just punch the ball into the box yeah. and it gets knocked around. And we, we scored on three sort of I'll call them goalkeeper errors, but just yeah. like the chaoticness of that. Yeah. Yeah. Three pretty big goals as well yeah. for us this year. And so the, the, the balance of like trying to break a team down, if they have, you know, 10 guys behind the ball, off of that restart versus get it to the area where the goal is scored. Yeah. You know, balancing that, I think the same could be said about a long throw um, as well. It's like, um, so again, I don't have all of the answers on that by any means. I'm, I'm always looking and searching. I would say we've played the, we've played that um, more chaotic game in the restart mm -hmm. world yeah. more than maybe in the past where we push the ball into the box and yeah. make things happen to some success in some ways. And some like long throw in. We started doing it two years ago. I hadn't done it really prior to 2019 much, and uh, hasn't been overly successful for us. Maybe we're not doing it right. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's, <laughs> so. I noticed that like you've on the on the on the defensive stand. I mean, you had you had you allowed ten goals against in 2017. That that following year, you only allowed two restarts. Then in 19, you had four. And then in 2021, you didn't concede any except for that PK that you were mentioning. I mean, yeah. that's pretty remarkable, right? Like to me, again, this is this is that margin game that you're you're playing and trying to 
whittle out sort of those goals where you, you can have a direct impact either on the offensive side or defensive side is how do you how do you minimize that and and I, it does it's a testament to the ten, only the 10 goals you scored because um i mean if you allowed 10 goals in 2017 on set plays i mean i'm i'm sure your numbers were 2x that i don't know in, in terms of goals allowed in the entire season guesstimating right but yeah. um yeah, that's that 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 is remarkable. I could go on about this stuff. That's just, um, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm definitely gonna ping you with more questions on this because I, I just started to take a look, and it's, I mean, we, I haven't even talked about your match checklist, which I think is awesome. I, I'll just ask as a wrap up, like, how do, how do you collect all this stuff? Is this after the fact, or do you have, do you have like some folks who are counting this stuff before? Um. So we have like a like a match day checklist that it's fairly simple to cr to collect most of it. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it you have to go through the game. If we have it broken down, it's a little bit easier to sort of figure out. Like essentially, I'll watch all the shots for and against, but mm -hmm. we can have those broken down already. Um, but the rest of the stuff, uh, assistant coaches, it's just like in, in video analysis. We'll break yeah. it down. It does become a challenge though sometimes like again the value of the time um to prepare for training versus what we're going to get from the match breakdown sometimes we get a game behind um i would say on different years we have been fortunate to have maybe a student worker or an intern who can help yeah. us with it somebody who's interested in the stuff some years not um and then the the full comp we're not tracking the other teams yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't play against until after the season's over. Yeah. Then we'll go through and look at our conference champion, regular season tournament, and also the NCAA champion. NCAA champion. I, I would love to have it for the final four teams. You know, yeah. if I had my way and my time and somebody to help me with it, I would have it for all of these things for everybody. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just kind of tracking what we can throughout the season and then putting it all together at the end of the season yeah. to try to digest what went on and like how we can prepare moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is, is, I mean, again, it gives you a realistic assessment of where your team is, right? Like, this is how we play. This is comparison to others. And you could see these disparities when you do disparities between teams. Okay, so what does the NCAA champion look like? What does Connecticut College look like versus Roanoke on certain key metrics? And I'm sure you could extrapolate from there. Well, if we want to get to this position, we at least have to do these three things to improve. I mean, at least it gives you directionally sort of where you want to head, right? And I think that's hugely valuable. But we'll uh, we'll, we'll move on because I definitely want to talk about you know the you hosting the national championship for the next three years because um, this is another one of my theories about having facilities and how important it is for for schools that want to compete and want to be at a certain level and, and how important it is to have their own sort of stadium atmosphere. But, you know, you from what I've seen online, you have some incredible facilities there at Roanoke. And and like I mentioned, I'm familiar with the the whole area just from Mount Union and and, and the Stag Bowl where the stadium, I mean, that's fan, was a fantastic place as well. But, uh, uh, you know, how, how pumped must you be for for hosting um for being yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's awesome i'm excited like uh real excited when i heard that we we got the bid and um i, I do think i mean the city of salem like i mentioned earlier when we we're talking about you know the different championships we've hosted they do do a tremendous job of hosting these championships and i think um making making it like a real valuable team valuable experience for the teams that have earned the right to be in the, the you know, the championship weekend for all of the sports. Um, great to show off our facility. It's, it's awesome. Donald Kerr uh, stadium is yeah. unbelievable. That's been here since 2007, but they built our, we built a, uh, an athletic center kind of built into the stadium mm -hmm. um, in 2016 uh, Craiger center. And so with that, it mean, it, it really tied in well and the, the way that the whole layout is, it's just a first class facility. So excited to show that off and um, host those teams. We, I, just, I think the backstory is Salem has, has won these bids again, I think because of their like um, 
the success they've had in hosting, you know, the mm -hmm. final four for men's and women's basketball yes. and football and everything. But the first one for soccer came up, we actually hosted in 2016, which was the first year we had our building. It was supposed to be in Greensboro. NCAA had um, canceled all the championships down in North Carolina over uh, yeah. I believe the bathroom law. Yeah. So, so kind of close to Greensboro, two hour drive. We don't have to switch too much. Salem said, Hey, we'll take it here. We got this new facility. Mm -hmm. um, and um, for, for us that, you know, it was, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Let's just see mm -hmm. how it goes. And this would be great. I, you know, I did have some, it wasn't a concern that Salem wouldn't be able to do it right. Cause I know they did the championships, right. But I'm like, first time soccer, like we know, yeah. football. we know how to do this. Like yeah. I want them to say, this is a yeah. soccer hub. Let's, you know, yeah. do well with it. And so uh, I think one of the pieces to that, that first year was also, I think it was the first year it was ever on turf as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we had just laid down a new turf. And so instead of on a gra uh, natural grass surface and um, all the feedback that I had heard from the coaches that were in it, that I, that I know that I talked to and um, the people who ran it and kind of feedback from the committee was that it was well ran and mm -hmm. the, the turf didn't play to be as big of an issue. And uh, even though I haven't been to a division three final four, I have actually I went to a division one final four when I was on staff at Wake Forest and that final four was in St. Louis and it snowed about, we got there two days before the game. It must've snowed like, a foot two days before the game we ended up having to practice uh in the uh where the rams used to play football inside yeah. and then they had to plow the field the games got pushed back and so i know the factor that a weather at that time of year can play into it and i, I can only imagine and also having seen over the years that f final fours where you're having men and women together which i, I love that they do it in division yeah. three but you got eight yeah four games then two yeah. games then one game on a yeah. grass field if you're getting weather yeah. yeah, a different game comes yeah, in. Yeah. So, um, I think that part went well, and I'm glad that we were able to win the bid again. And I'm um, excited to host and uh, show off our facility and host the teams that, you know, earn the right to be there. Now, I I'm assuming, do you aspire? <laughs> do you aspire to be playing in front of your home crowd? Yeah, I mean, I've aspired. I've aspired. <laughs> Before we were hosting it all the time. Um, I mean, at Roanoke College, we have a basketball and a lacrosse national championship. Um, we don't have one in men's soccer. So, you know, it's always it's it is the aspiration. Um, you know, there's controllable and uncontrollable factors yeah, to, to yeah. get there, which, you know, you, you deal with. But I certainly think that it's um, it's. It's been on my mind since we've won the bid, you know, not to say that we weren't trying already, but like, you know, the, just the excitement of the opportunity yeah. and um, to try to you know, like be in the field and see what kind of run can can be made there. So, yeah, I'd say for sure there, there's a, an ambition and an aspiration. And I, I believe that our work rate will will meet that ambition to see what we can do. Yeah. Um, let me ask you as we shift over, because I want to ask you about recruiting, but does does it from a recruiting perspective, does hosting help? I mean, aside from, I mean, you get to show off your the facilities in front of a larger crowd, but does does that? Uh, thing I for think it's. You? I think it's still to be determined. I mean, I've I've definitely said it to recruits that yeah. we, we have, and I think it it does intrigue them. But mm -hmm. I, you know. I think it the, facility, the facility itself helps maybe more so than the fact that we're hosting, but the fact that we're hosting goes, yeah. Oh, doubles down on the facility being great, yeah, yeah. you know? So I, I think that's it more than anything. Um, yeah, we'll have to see after a couple of years, it's, it's hard to say, like I said, in 2016, um, when it was here, um, you know, that was a new facility as well, but yeah. I, I definitely think our, you know, we had a strong 2017 and 18 team, but our 19 team that got the at-large bid, I think certainly was a repercussion of having a new facility and maybe yeah. hosting it and being able to like create the buzz about the setup that we have down here moving forward. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll say the only other thing about that, like we, I learned a lot watching that 16 final four here. That's uh -huh. so selfishly, I got a lot out of it in that way too, you know, more than recruiting, <laughs> like, to be fair, my, my players as well, like the athleticism of the teams that were in it. Um, it's not a knock to any of their soccer either. Cause I thought that I thought they all played in a certain way that they were trying to, the last stuff the area, yeah. but just the athleticism was just on a high level. And I think for my guys at that point to be able to see that 
to take into their own offseason workouts. Like, like, hey, we've got to make improvements here. It was, yeah. um, I think it's persisted to us now where it's not, there's not a separation as much on a given day. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah that, that was a big piece that I took from that to see those teams that yeah. year. So I think lesson learned from that one as well. Yeah. Well, now you got three years. I'm definitely going to have to make a trip down there. That's for sure. But um, just to to shift over to recruiting, I ask all the coaches this. When you go out looking at players, are you looking at for players or are you looking for positions? I would say we're pretty hybrid here. Um, I always will try to analyze like like what we've lost in terms of minutes played. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, we lose a guy who played a lot of minutes and obviously what he did there as well and so we'll be aware of positionally what we will need to replace um but we're also sort of in a situation where you know if it's if Ronald college is the right fit for a very very good player um academically socially athletically and we are sort of jammed in that spot i'm probably not turning that player down if they're mm-hmm. good enough to impact us and so we're we're recruiting that player in the same way if we think we can you know, attract them here to run a college. Um, so from that standpoint, you have to do a little bit of like, hey, you know, three center midfielders. I mean, my, I, I feel like we have a, one of the top left backs in in the league and I think in the country right now, he was a central player a lot of times as a youth player and uh-huh. out of Connecticut. So, you know, certainly move guys to, to what we see when they get here as well. But I think it's a little bit of a hybrid with us first identifying our needs and then secondly identifying like what we're able to attract sure. here yeah, yeah, yeah um and, and let me ask you the uh, honest question what when you see a high school high school player or, or a high school grad comes to roanoke where, what are some of the things that you think that they're not prepared for i was using the term lacking and i got sort of told well they're not lacking they're yeah. it's just a different level but yeah what what do you see from that standpoint um i mean to, to be fair like the most of i i could talk about would be like off-field stuff like mm-hmm. like how, how to how to adjust to the first year of college and keep like stay on the grind of the season you know that kind of thing but mm-hmm. the on-field stuff maybe um just being like so I tend to I tend to like I'll say technical players, guys who can make decisions on the ball, have good habits on the ball. I tend to like that tends to attract me in recruiting as a piece of like what I like to have here um, to work with. That being said, I think there's sometimes is not um, they haven't been pressed or organizedly pressed or athletically pressed at the level that they might when they get here and that sometimes is an adjustment so like i'll watch a youth game and a guy will be fantastic on the ball and play side to side and backwards and also make good (laughs) decisions going forward and keep the ball at a high level and then get here and maybe not understand why that's not effective for him immediately like like changing to the effectiveness of the college game and mostly in that the teams have are organized in their ability to press the ball back off of you and it's more athletic players as well. So, um, I mean, I guess you could call it the, the cliche speed of play, so to speak, but I think it's also just like an understanding of like match management and situation also, yeah. because I do believe like that same player, once they can understand, like, uh, I can't do that in this part of the field. I can do that at a high level in this part of the field and still be effective. Yeah. That player is very good and it translates well. But I think maybe lacking that understanding of like the yeah. best player on a good youth team picking the ball up inside their own defensive third in in the 18 and then combining like five passes up the field. It's <laughs> like, I don't know. You might not be able to do that here. You know <laughs> what I mean? There might be something more to like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So. Um. How, how is your recruiting class looking? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, we were fortunate that we have nine guys returning for their fifth year yeah. COVID year. Um, I think five or six of which are sort of all ODAC players, which is you know mm-hmm. positive as well. Um, and so th- 
you know, the best recruit you can get. I, I couldn't get a better recruit than a 23 yeah. year old who's yeah. already been in college soccer <laughs> yeah. for that time. But it doesn't mean that we didn't have needs um, still and also protecting the future of the program. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited about what we have coming in. We've, we've felt some needs so far. I think they're maybe, you know, are pretty close to roster size right now, if, if not there with offers out. But, um, yeah, I'm excited about what we got coming in. Very good. Um, what's the best way for someone to get your attention if they're interested in Roanoke? Yeah, I email um, myself, our assistants, um, and, you know, I think, kind of covered this maybe with other coaches as well. Yeah. I don't know how much yeah. more I'd have to share, but just concise information that includes grad year. Yeah. Um, you know, I always do these recruiting lectures at, at uh, different events or camps or whatever, and you go like, put something in there specific to us if you are specifically <laughs> interested in us. I yeah. think it's a two-way street. I mean, if I send mass emails that don't have anything about the player specifically, the chance yeah. of them responding back to that is – less than yeah. if I say, saw like what you did on the left side yeah. today, da, 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 da. So I think it's two way street, you know, if you've done some research yeah. to know, but yes, send us an email and then we'll, you know, tirelessly try to get to everything yeah. that we can see players live camps is another good way, obviously at the player's expense. Um, yeah. But 50%, 60% of our recruits have come to something of ours one day yeah. at the camp, you know, spent time on campus with us and it's been mm -hmm. a big piece as well. Not the only way to get recruited, but certainly I think an effective one. I, I always think now my, my theory is that camp ID camps that are hosted by you. Uh, and if a player goes to it, that's an indication of interest, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm not taking my time out of my day to come play at a place that I have no plans to go to, right? right. I think that's a real positive. Um, so what I usually do is I just sort of go on your website and just sort of glean some information. I put it down in the description. If there's anything else you want me to post, by all means, feel free to to send my way, and I'll 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 add it add it to you. Um, yeah, and and. I think that covers it. So I, I really, really do appreciate it. this. Was this was fantastic? This was I, I, I could we could do I, we might have to do this again at some point. Just talking about statistics in soccer. Yeah, <laughs> and, sure. You know, like yeah. um, it, it, it's something that in, that intrigues me. So, but um, yeah, wait, wait, wait till after my spring season. I'll see what what is actually applicable from this year yeah. where we can improve and i'll tell you if, I'm, if, I'm, if the numbers are right or not but yeah, uh, yeah I, keep, I, I keep thinking like every time i come up with oh these statistics are meaningful then the next game they totally go out the window yeah. Right? <laughs> it's Soccer. Soccer. yeah yeah so coach thank you thanks appreciate the time and um yeah let's at least let's hopefully connect uh before the the season just before you go into preseason and can get a feel for for what you're thinking for for the fall yeah thank you thanks for having me and uh, good luck with everything appreciate what you're doing for the uh promotion of the game at our level and yeah appreciate it, it was great conversing yeah all right thank you all right, thanks yeah